the words of Isaiah 12. I will praise you, Lord. Although you were angry with me, your anger has turned away, and you have comforted me. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord himself is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Give praise to the Lord and proclaim his name. Make known among the nations what he has done and proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord for he has done glorious things. Let this be known to all the world. Shout aloud and sing for joy, O people of City Collective. For great is the Holy One of Israel among you. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven not to give. Glory and joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold my hope. To this. 
Father, we declare that in you we are made new every day. Your mercies are new every morning. We declare that you are our strength and our shield and our salvation. We rest secure in you. In this we are sure. Amen. Wonderful. Well, it's great to see your faces on this side. Uh, this Sunday morning, as I mentioned, it is the first Sunday of, of Advent. And I don't know what tradition you might have come from or if you have uh, ever been in church before, but Advent, it, it was a, uh, a new for, for myself and for, for our family uh, a few years ago. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't a normal tradition for us. And, and Advent is this beautiful space that we're invited to, to, to wait with expectation uh, we'll, we're going to talk about it extensively, but you'll notice that we've got uh, one candle lit at the front here. And, and I just want to invite you this morning, uh, wherever you find yourself on your journey of faith, we, we say it often, we, we'll say it, well, and we'll keep on saying it, uh, Christian, non-Christian, atheist, agnostic, uh, more likely to believe in Santa Claus than Jesus, you're not really too sure uh, Christmas at all, uh, this is a safe place as we kind of consider what it looks like within the scriptures, within community, and within the story of Jesus to, to see our lives be completely captivated in a way that moves us forward. This, this first candle that we lit this morning signifies hope. Sometimes it's called the, the prophecy candle, and, and it represents the expectation that the people of Israel felt in the anticipation of the coming Messiah. And hope is an interesting thing because hope means that something is needed, that something is absent. And I think for, for someone like myself, I, I can find myself hoping, but having it feel more like yearning, longing desiring something that isn't present. It, do, it doesn't feel particularly hopeful, perhaps, in a traditional definition of the term. And I wonder this morning, as we begin this Advent season of waiting, is there something that you long for? Is there something that you yearn for? How many times a day do you, do you think about it? Because hope can be hard. Waiting is, is hard. And this first advent, it signifies what the people of Israel were feeling. They were feeling this, this confusion and this frustration in all that they were doing. And they were longing for this Messiah that was foretold of to come and to save them. And this king doesn't end up coming in a way they expected. And perhaps that in itself is of great value to us that our longings and our yearnings are not often fulfilled in the manner that which we anticipated it to. So Advent, it's this internal conflict of waiting, of anticipation, of frustration, of confusion, and of excitement. Who is this Messiah? And why do we need him? And so, like we just did, we're, we're going to the beginning of Matthew to discover the Messiah that was spoken of. Now, I'm not going to reread everything. I'm just going to reread the opening verse. And I want to point out a couple things as, as we begin. And it says, this is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, Mia, perhaps you've seen her and heard her 
perhaps talking a little bit this morning. And she is a curious little girl. Uh, you take her into a new space and she starts looking around side to side. Uh, she, she doesn't really want to sit super still. Her eyes are taking in everything around her. But she definitely knows mama and dada's voice. And she, she, she's aware of it. But it's not, it's not enough for her to simply be aware of it. We speak to her in, in a certain way. We, we make sure that there's, there's ways in which we'll, we'll, we'll call out her name or, or approach her that will cause her to, to calm, to, to find maybe a little bit of rest or, or to find a sense of joy and to look toward us and to connect with us and to have that, that moment where she gives us her full attention. There's a way in which we speak that she's able to better connect and give attention. And this is happening right from this first line of the Gospel of Matthew. It's happening all the way through this genealogy, but I want to note very specifically in this first line. In, in, in the original text, in the, in the Greek, we see that there's two words that come up in this opening line. And, and one is translated into the word book, and then the other is translated into the word genealogy. But it's also translated into the word Genesis. So, Matthew is actually beginning his writings of the good news. He's got good news for all people. And he wants us to know it, but he's beginning his writings with this language. That the book of new Genesis wrought by Jesus Christ. Or this is the, the genesis of a new world through Jesus. And where else do we see this language of Genesis in the Bible? Well, at the very beginning of the Old Testament. At the very beginnings of, of the writings of the Jewish people to whom he is writing to and, and speaking to. This is not by accident. Matthew is speaking to them in such a way that they would give him his full attention, their full attention. He's saying that what you're about to read is about the recreation of the world. The beginning of things has begun again. And, and he, he doesn't leave it there. Because he names the promises of Jesus. Messiah, son of David, son of Abraham. Jesus is the fulfillment of all of these promises. It's the promises given to Abraham, the father of Israel. He's a son of Abraham. Jesus is the fulfillment of promises given to David. He is in the line of the king of David. And it was a well-known fact among the Jewish people that the Messiah would come from the line of David. This was the fulfillment of that promise. And there was moments of prophecy, the king to come, the anointed one, the Messiah. The Messiah is a figure that we read about through all of the Old Testament. But in particular, we see it in the Psalms and the prophets. And it's a figure that's on the horizon of the world. He's on the horizon of the future of one day someone would come to usher in God's healing and restoring and recreating power to the broken world that he sees. This is what the prophets would call the kingdom of God, which we've talked about extensively over the course of the fall. So, in one jam-packed opening line that you and I in our Western sensibilities are actually probably quick to, to jump over, Matthew makes a compelling first statement. He's saying right out of the gate, Jesus is the climax of the story of Israel and the world. And he's making all things new. That's a bold way to start off your good news. It's this cliffhanger that we find at the Old Testament that points us to Jesus. His good news is the Messiah is here, his name is Jesus, and it is a new beginning. Now, we read the genealogy together, uh, and the honest question I have for you is, did you glaze over a part? I know I basically did at a moment, so I couldn't, I couldn't pronounce it. Um, did, did you skip over something? Did your mind go back to the game against Croatia this morning thinking about missed opportunities? Yeah, we, 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 were, we were all there. Uh, did, were you able to stay present in it? 
Now, I don't, I don't blame you. This is not meant to make you feel, feel guilty. Uh, I don't blame you if you feel like you kind of glazed over in that moment and you weren't sure what was going on. This, this, this kind of writing, this, this genealogy, this kind of focus on family lines, it isn't really part of how we function and operate within, within Western culture. I, I think a few years ago, there was this, this influx and this excitement about the 23andMe test that you spin in a vial, you send it off, they tell you where you're from. This was like, everybody was excited about it, and they, they wanted to figure out where their family heritage was from, but it was more novelty and, and something that was like a fun quirk than something that was like deeply meaningful and intertwined within our cultural fabric. This is the way it is in Western culture. It's not that way within an Eastern mindset. Within the Eastern culture, you see far more focus and, and, and emphasis placed upon family lines and lineages from which people come from. You are a son and daughter of someone. Tracing your family tree is in fact a vibrant part of your identity. It's a core part of who you are. So for him to present this right off the bat is of actually incredible value to those who are listening and reading within a first century perspective. And he Wright, he says this, he says, For many cultures, ancient and modern, and certainly in the Jewish world of Matthew's day, this genealogy was the equivalent of a roll of drums, a fanfare of trumpets, and a town crier calling for attention. Any first century Jew would find this family tree both impressive and compelling. Like a great procession down a city street, we watch figures at the front and the ones in the middle, but all eyes are waiting for the one who comes in the position of greatest honor right at the end. The whole thing is building to this climax of Jesus the Messiah. All that is to say for you and for me who might glaze over when we read this passage, Matthew knows his first century Jewish audience, and for them this is incredibly compelling. So we're going to explore how this genealogy of Jesus reveals the person of Jesus. On the surface, this is a normal genealogy. Let's understand what's taking place. Matthew is he's making a, a claim. He's saying Jesus is the Messiah. And to begin his claim, he needs to back up this idea that this unqualified rabbi from Nazareth, from the north, not from the main city in Jerusalem, this unqualified rabbi was who he says he is. And so what he does is he, he uses prophecy, he uses promises, and he uses the bloodline of royalty to point to Jesus. All this is to say he wants to present the fact that Jesus is a valid candidate to be Messiah. But there's actually more to the way that Matthew writes. Matthew is a brilliant writer and it comes to life in this opening chapter. What Matthew is doing here is not simply providing us a comprehensive list of his family tree. He's actually providing a selective list. In fact, if you were to go through the, the traditional family tree and, and list out every single individual, there are actually certain generations that are left out purposely. Because the objective here is for him to be very straightforward and to make an important point. He's telling the fact of this by his, his selectivity. There's a selective pattern. And when you have a selective pattern, there is a specific purpose. For, for those who might be more creative in the room and, or someone, someone who are maybe more uh, structured in the room, whenever you're doing something intentionally, selectively, there's a purpose to, behind it. You're, you're trying to get from point A to point B. You're trying to direct people towards a singular thought. And in order to see how this passage speaks to us, we need to see how this would have spoken to a first century Jew. And there are layers, and I'm going to, there's many layers to this genealogy. We're going to look at three of them this morning that I want us to pay attention to. And I hope maybe some of them popped out to you as we, as we read them earlier. Number one, uh, Jesus, his line is full of unwelcome and unwelcome people and chooses to include women. Jesus' line is full of the unwelcome and chooses to include women. Now, 
you would think that if Matthew was trying to make a claim for the royal bloodline and he was selective in his process, he would have put out the best and the brightest. He would have made it seem like, man, like this guy came from good stock. We can trust him. He would have put his best foot forward to be sure that the line of Jesus reflects the person of Jesus. Look where he came from. Perhaps you, you recognize some of the names and you've already noticed this, but, but the line of Jesus is full of people who are unwelcome and who are of disrepute. Wicked kings, corrupt fathers, incestuous relationships, despicable acts against others. This line is not what would seem to be the best marketing tool. In fact, like I said, Matthew, he goes one step further and he chooses to include women. Now, within first century Israel, we need to understand it's a patriarchal culture. So women rarely would have made an appearance, appearance in a genealogy, let alone a genealogy that was outlining a royal bloodline. And, and the women that he chooses to include in the genealogy, that there are four matriarchs in the Jewish tradition, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah. And those are the four that most would have known, the four that are most prosperous, perhaps, within the, the, the Jewish mindset. And yet those are not the four that are included. Instead, you have Rahab, a Canaanite, a prostitute from the city of Jericho. Then you have Tamar, also a Canaanite. And you read about her, her chaotic and, and unjust story in Genesis 39, where her husband dies and, and her father refuses to remarry her to, her younger, uh, to, to the younger son, despite that being the tradition of the time. And so she, she dresses herself as, as a prostitute on the side of the road and seduces her father-in-law to get pregnant. This is a wild story. And then there's Ruth, who was a Moabite. And Moabites were descendants of Lot. And Lot's incestuous relationship with his daughter. And therefore, Moabites were hated by Jews and Gentiles alike. And then we have the wife of Uriah. It doesn't even get named. Perhaps you know the story of King David and, and Bathsheba. A king who uses his power in an unjust way kills Uriah, sleeps with Bathsheba. And the power dynamic at play speaks of something horrific that took place. And her husband, the one that's outlined in this story, is unwelcome as well. He's a Hittite. He's not a Jew. Matthew has four women in the genealogy, three of which are Gentiles and not Jewish at all, and none of which would probably have been a moral exemplar, but they're all present in the royal bloodline of Jesus. All this to say, in, in the people that Matthew chooses to present, he's saying this. The story of the Messiah, very simply, is an invitation for all people. Not just Jews, but Gentiles. Not just men, but women. Not just Jewish men of good rapport, but all people. And for some of you, maybe this is what you need to hear this morning. The genealogies of the time would have likely wished to forget many of these men and women included in the line of Jesus. Jesus. When the world and history wish to forget you, God refuses to. In fact, you're not just remembered, but you're actually welcomed into his family. This is what the story is telling us. This is the fulfilled promise of the Messiah, one who comes to save. Second layer I want us to pay attention to in the genealogy is that the number 14 matters. I don't know if you caught it. We, we reread the very first verse, but in the 17th verse, three different occasions, we see the number 14 mentioned. 
And perhaps you've been like me and you've read this before and you've read that verse and you're like, oh, 14 must be meaning something and you just kind of skip over it and you go to the part where the Christmas story starts. But the number 14, it matters. Numbers speak to something. And they do in our modern imagination as well. Uh, I, I, I love sports. I've already referenced the soccer game this morning. That is always a commitment of mine to find a way to include that within our church culture, sports. Yeah. But if I, if I was, whether or not you, you like sports, or it's, it's a thing for you. If I say the number 23 and I talk about sports, I'm referencing Michael Jordan. If I, if I am... If I was to use the number 99 and I'm referencing hockey, we're talking about Gretzky. There's associations. There's associations of numbers to people. And within Hebrew writing and understanding, there's a literary device where numbers have a symbolic meaning. In the Hebrew language, there are no numbers technically within their, their alphabet. But if you think of it this way, uh, within English, if it was A is equal to 1, B is equal to 2, C is equal to 3, we see it play out a certain way within the Hebrew language as well. And in Hebrew, David's name, King David's name, actually plays out in three letters. Dalet, Vav, and Dalet. Dalet, D, is equal to 4. Vav, 6. D, 4. Do the math. 4, 6, 4, we get... 14. So 14 was a symbolic number for King David. And just like you and I, when we hear the number 23 and we think Jordan, we hear the number 99, we think Gretzky, when the Jewish people heard the number 14, they thought King David. Most people in the room, if they were hearing this, would have led to that place of, he's talking about King David. And notice that David himself, he shows up at the very beginning of the genealogy. He shows up twice at the end, and then once right in the middle where it is number, you guessed it, 14 on the list. So this is Matthew's way of saying that Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise to King David. This is the fulfilled promise of David taking place. Number three, the third layer I want us to pay attention to is one thing is not like the others. If we look at the third section of the genealogy, you'll notice that there's actually 13 that are outlined. And then we get to what would you expect to be number 14. And it speaks of Joseph, the father of Jesus. And it, and it says it a little bit differently. All the way through it says, so-and-so is the father of so-and-so, and, and so on, and so on, and so on. And then it gets to the very end, and it says that Joseph is the husband of Mary, which is out of place. One thing is not like the others, because what are you expecting? Joseph, the father of Jesus. The question that Matthew is, is leading us towards is who is that 14th father? Who is the 14th father? This, this whole genealogy is a setup for the Christmas story. And who is the 14th father? Father, we'll read the rest of uh, Matthew chapter 1 before next week and we'll talk about that more. But for this week when we're talking through the genealogy, Matthew is saying Jesus is more than just the long-awaited Messiah. This is actually the climax of the story of Israel. This is, this is the son of Abraham. This is the fulfillment of the promise to Abraham, the fulfillment of the promise of the Messiah, fulfillment of the promise to David, and the fulfillment of the promise of Abraham. And why does this matter to us? I think that's ultimately where we often come to when reading a passage like this. Well, Matthew is speaking to the reader to confirm the identity of Jesus, not simply in his royal bloodline, but in who he is. And the genealogy of, of Jesus, it matters to us in three different ways. One, it provides us with a picture of who God is. 
in every bit of this story of the genealogy, I want you to see that this is the story of one who welcomes the stranger, who forgives the sinful, who redeems the lost, who reconciles the broken, who empowers the unqualified, who sees the unseen. This passage is picture after picture of who God is. And I wonder when we read it, if we can ask ourselves the question, who is he to us today? What's the picture of God that I'm holding? And does it actually meet me where I'm at? Because this comprehensive, this selective list that comprehensively covers all of our stories is inviting you and I into the family of God, not simply to be an outsider, but to be one and same, to be the sons and daughters of the king that has come. It provides us with pictures of who God is. If you're feeling forgotten, welcome to the family. You're feeling rejected, welcome to the family. You're feeling unqualified. You're feeling undeserving, broken, too far gone. Welcome to the family. This is an invitation to all people. It provides us with a picture of who God is. Number two, it is a reminder of God's promises. We've outlined them, that he, it's a fulfillment of the promise of the Messiah, of the promise to King David, and the promise of the son of Abraham. And the thing is, we all need reminders. We all experience how hard life can be. And life can get us to points where it knocks out the good memories and replaces them with current frustrations. We need reminders of who God is, that he is a promise-keeping God, that Jesus is the fulfillment of generations of promises to Abraham, to David, to the people of Israel, and the fulfillment of those promises is just a reflection of his character and the promises that he gives to you and I, that is the same God that is giving them and the same God that will fulfill them. I need those reminders sometimes. That the promises that have been spoken over my life, the promises that I've read within the scriptures are the promises that remain true today despite my circumstances. And number three, it's a foundation for hope to be found in our story. Because like we said at the beginning, hope is hard. Hope is waiting. It's yearning. And perhaps this unexpected passage today can provide a foundation for you to hope again. It's, it's easy sometimes. I know for myself, when I look at the story that is outlined here in the genealogy and, and my own life, it's easy to sometimes reflect back and think to myself, well, I can see God's hand at work in my story. It's hard to believe that in the present moment. We, we think to ourselves and we, and we make excuses as to why that won't happen again. That was a one-off. You should look at how bad it's gotten now. But the hand of God has always been getting his people back on track even when we've fallen away. And it's through Jesus that we find that hope over and over and over again. Your hope is not misplaced. Your hope is a strength and your hope is still possible when it's found in him. I see the I see the promises and the difficulties that have been at play in my life. There is unfulfilled promise in my life. There's unfulfilled hope in my life. And the honest truth is that is often hard to handle. It's hard to have that feeling and, and come before God. And the people of Israel that had experienced 400 years of what they called darkness, they were waiting. And the first thing that Matthew is saying to them is that there is a new creation that is taking place, that has come. Have some hope. 
the arrival of Jesus is the confirmation and proclamation of a promise-keeping God. And so for some of us this morning, um, maybe you never read the promises of God or you don't know them. Or you've, you're here and you feel like you've just forgotten them. The promises that are found in the word for his sons and his daughters, for his children, are the promises for you. And you know there's, there's this difference that we experience between knowing something and, and knowing something. It's like no with three exclamation points at the end of it. It's like the difference between those two experiences of knowing the promises of God. This genealogy, these are pictures of God, these are reminders of God's promises, and they are the foundation of hope that sometimes we need in our stories. Because the promises that we come to know lead us through the moments when we don't. Worship team, can you just join me at the front? For some of you this, this morning, uh, you're, you're doing fantastic. And that's awesome. I want to celebrate that. That's so good. And for some of you, you're, you're hearing all this and you're having a tough time believing that God is leading you. That God's promises are for you. That God's hand is on your life. I've heard John Mark Comer say that God's God's hand is involved in your story to the degree that you open your life to his authorship. And every day, we open a blank page of our lives. And the invitation this morning is, Jesus, write. We're the, we get to be characters in the story of God. What a joy that is. To find our hope in one that invites us into his family. This isn't just a genealogy, it's an invitation to join the story. That he can take anybody and anything from anywhere, physically, mentally, emotionally. All things are possible through the one who has come to seek and save those who are lost whose promises remain true for me and for you in this season and in the next, when it doesn't feel like it and when it does. The beginning of Advent is one of hope, not because we have a perfect idea of what every situation is going to look like, but because we know that one has come who is who he says he is, the Messiah, the Savior that we need, and he wants to welcome us into his family. So this morning, if you are in a space and you don't know this Jesus, I would invite you. It, it isn't uh, an elaborate process of checking boxes to be welcomed into the family of God. It is very simply just saying yes. Turning from what was, from where we're going and towards him. And receiving that welcome invitation of hope. For some of you, you need to be encouraged. You feel like you're locked into the current moment, unable to move past it, and you don't know how any of, any of your faith is actually changing or making your life for the better. Let's not forget that this Christmas season is not that he's going to come and give you the good life. It's that he's going to come and be with us. So as I pray, I just invite you, bring, bring your whole self, whatever burden it is that you're carrying, to him. He loves you just as you are and welcomes you into his family. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that even within a, a genealogy where we might glaze over, you don't let anything go to waste. That within the stories of history gone by, it is a story of who you are and who we are to you. Your children, sons and daughters, royalty because we belong to the king. 
for the challenges and struggles within our heart, I pray right now that the promises that we know lead us through the seasons when we don't. And if we need to be reminded of your unfailing love, of your unconditional goodness towards us, of your kindness that leads us to repentance, the promises that we need, may we be reminded this morning, whether it is in the words of our worship, conversations with one another from the sermon that we just spent time in. May we be reminded of who you are and may we find a foundation of hope in you that grounds us in every season. May hope be found this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Would you stand to your feet as we, as we sing? So come thou long expected Jesus born to save thy people free from our fears and sins release us let us find our rest in thee Israel's strength in consolation home of all the earth or time in a benediction. I just wanted to take note. Uh, if you have one of these journals, if you don't have them, we have them freely available to you out in the foyer. Uh, as we enter a, a new season, a new sermon series, uh, we have an Advent uh, devotional that is within this that we would love for you to engage with. Uh, the first week is Hope, and we have a poem from Walter Brueggemann that we would invite you to reflect upon this week. If you feel comfortable, would you extend your hands with me as we close our time in a benediction? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May his promises ring true in any season, in every season we find ourselves in. And may we know that right now. Love God, love people, be the church. Almost Merry Christmas. We'll see you soon.